Good morning to you all. I'm grateful to Matt for his invitation to take part in this important conversation. Um, this is a conference on science and faith, um, and it's great to see many of you here. Um, from my experience, college students are generally not that interested in this topic. Uh, some of them are turned off by all the controversy and the debate historically that surrounded the issues. Um, can't we just all get along? Um, and I feel them on that point. Heated debate and polemic doesn't always bring out the best in people. Um, I've met others uh, who would say that the kind of conference that we're doing here is interesting, but it's not really their cup of tea. Uh, sounds like it's going to be one of those abstract academic discussions. If you're into that kind of thing, then have at it. Uh, but these are not really issues that apply to most people. With all due respect, if that's you, um, that's actually dead wrong. Right? The questions we'll be wrestling with over this weekend, they get at what it means to live in the 21st century. How do we make sense of our lives, and what does God have to do with it? I really enjoyed Ian's talk yesterday evening. Uh, I think that was a great way to kick things off. Um, but let me begin with a quote. All our thinking today is shaped irrevocably by modern science. A blind acceptance of the New Testament mythology would be arbitrary. It would mean accepting a view of the world in our faith and religion, which we should deny in our everyday life. Modern thought, as we have inherited it, brings with it criticism of the New Testament view of the world. Man's knowledge and mastery of the world have advanced to such an extent through science and technology that it is no longer possible for anyone seriously to hold the New Testament view of the world. In fact, there is no one who does. It is impossible to use electric light and the wireless and to avail ourselves of modern medical and surgical discoveries and at the same time to believe in the New Testament world of spirits and miracles. So some of you will recognize it, right? It's a famous quote by Rudolf Bultmann, a German New Testament scholar who died in around 1976. And he was saying that modern people like us, um, we cannot believe the Bible any longer. Uh, the world of the Bible is pre-scientific, it's pre-modern, it's a bunch of ancient myths. Uh, the writers of scripture believed in heaven and hell, they believed in angels and demons, exorcisms. These are concepts that we no longer believe in. You use your smartphones, you drive a car, you take medication. Your world is the world of science and technology. You cannot believe in the mythical world of the Bible. So that's essentially, not my view, right? That's essentially what this fellow, Boltmann, was saying decades ago. He was an old-fashioned theological liberal. And so you might dismiss what he's saying as liberal Christianity selling out the faith again. But before you start putting on your gloves, I do think, I do think Boltman is describing how people often feel, many of them Christians. Boltman said these things over 60 years ago, but he's not the only one. In um, 2007, um, Charles Taylor wrote a big book titled A Secular Age, and he wrote quite eloquently about how our lives as modern people have, been, have become so secular. Many others are saying the same thing. As modern people, we live as if God does not exist. The things that we take for granted, what we call, what sociologists call our plausibility structures, those tend to be naturalistic. The things that animate us, the things that preoccupy our thoughts and leisure time, they are not divine things. Even among serious confessional Christians, God has become something like an interesting hobby, not at the very core of who I am. We live schizophrenically, compartmentalizing our lives in strangely modern and unbiblical ways. I mean, you might, there might be someone sitting here who's just like, I'm not a Christian, so... Well, in your case, what I'm describing is the only world you know, 
a secular world, the world that science makes accessible to us. If you're a Christian, things get really muddled. Maybe when you're in church or at a science and faith conference, you are thinking deeply about God and about faith and so on. But then over here, it's the rest of your life. It's where you live and move and have your being. And if someone were to inspect that part of your life real closely, they might come away with a niggling worry. At the worst of times, the lives of Christians don't seem very different from the lives of our non-Christian friends and neighbors. Uh, we live in a post-Christian secular age. Now, I know I'm generalizing, right? So I'm sorry. Uh, and I could nuance all of that, what I've just said. But I, hopefully you get the idea. So in the rest of this talk, I want to think out loud about this situation. How should science interact with spiritual and theological reality? And what I want to do first is describe a very common way that scientists have thought about this issue. It's called methodological naturalism. You're kidding me, right? Methodological natural. It doesn't really roll off the tongue, I admit. But um, don't be intimidated, because I'm going to explain it in plain English, um, what that is. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to raise some questions about this approach to science. And I'm going to ask whether it's the best option for Christians. And then finally, I'm going to propose a different way of thinking about science and faith. So if you're a Christian, how should you think about the scientific work that you're doing? You're working in the laboratory. How does God relate to the work that you're doing? How do spiritual realities relate to what you do in the lab? Here's the answer according to methodological naturalism. The material world, what we call nature, that is God's creation. Science is how we investigate God's creation. We try to figure out how it works. What are the underlying structures and mechanisms? What are the natural processes within God's creation? Science gives us access to answering those questions. Non-Christian scientists are able to do good science because God has made them in the image of God, in, in, in his image. Their ability to think creatively and to think intelligently about nature reflects God who is creative and intelligent. And even if an unbelieving scientist denies that God exists, it's still the case that his best insights are only possible because of God's grace, God's common grace in their lives. Now here's the thing. According to methodological naturalism, when Christians are practicing science, they should do so as if God does not exist. They should do science as if there are only natural entities in the world, so that if you're in the lab and you're giving scientific descriptions, you must not talk about God or angels or any other supernatural entities. You can only talk about physical, natural things. That's just part of what it means to be a good scientist. So um, we need to be careful, though, because I've been talking about methodological naturalism. But there's something else called metaphysical naturalism. So these two ideas are not the same thing, right? Um, again, here's what I said about methodological naturalism. You can be a Christian, you can be a believer, someone who loves the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You can believe everything the Bible teaches. You can be someone who shares the gospel with friends, someone who prays regularly, someone who believes in a wide range of supernatural things. But when you are working as a scientist, when you are dealing with scientific theories or experiments, you must never appeal to any supernatural realities. You have to keep all such beliefs separate from your work as a scientist. So as a churchgoer, as a believer, as a religious person, you can believe all you want about spiritual things. But as a scientist, those beliefs are not allowed. 
That's methodological naturalism, and most Christians take that approach to their scientific work. Metaphysical naturalism is a different ball of wax, right? According to metaphysical naturalism, none of those things really exist, right? There is no God. There are no angels. There are no demons. There are no spiritual realities at all. The only things that are real in this world are things that are physical or natural. Supernatural entities do not exist according to metaphysical naturalism. In other words, metaphysical naturalism is just a synonym for atheism. So remember, Christian methodological naturalists are different. In their regular lives, they believe all those things. They believe in God, they believe in supernatural things, just not when they are doing science. At this point, then, you might be wondering, why would a Christian be a methodological naturalist? What reasons do they give for taking this position? Uh, let me mention a few. All right, think about science. You're trying to figure out how the world works. What are the underlying processes? Imagine if, as a scientist, every time you didn't understand something, every time there was a gap in your knowledge, Imagine if your immediate reaction was to appeal to a miracle. Or here, miracles just happened. If you did that, it would be checkmate, game over, right? Because that would spell the end of science. Because instead of persevering in your work, instead of working hard to understand this particular part of the natural world, you would stop investigating, right? Because you now suspect something supernatural is going on and you would end up perhaps missing the natural processes that God designed into the world. Uh, so I hope you see that, right? Acting as if God does not exist, if you're a scientist, acting as if God does not exist protects you from rushing too quickly to a supernatural explanation. Maybe you just haven't found the natural explanation yet. Keep working at it. Don't give up too soon. Here's another reason Christians take this approach. Methodological naturalism allows people with different faiths to participate in the same enterprise of science. It allows people with no faith at all and people with, who are religious to the core, they can collaborate together. They can work together in the lab. Outside the lab, you can have whatever religious beliefs you want, but when you're doing actual science, keep those beliefs kind of locked in a cage. Um, so methodological naturalists who are Christians, they will say that science and theology are complementary disciplines, right? Um, Ian actually kind of spoke to that, the complementarity between science and theology yesterday. And so natural processes they can have two distinct complementary causes. On the one hand, God is the primary cause of everything that happens in his creation. He sustains the creation moment by moment. If we want to explain things at that level, we can use the language of theology and the language of philosophy. Um, on the other hand, we can explore those same events in creation as a material, physical process in terms of secondary causes. Science explains things at that level. Methodological naturalism is only concerned with secondary causes. We don't say anything about God because he only comes in at the level of primary causes. So those are some of the reasons most scientists who are believers have adopted methodological naturalism. Um, for my part, I see the benefit of this approach, but I have some concerns. Um, here's the problem I have. Methodological naturalism decides to limit the kinds of beliefs that we can have when investigating God's creation. My question is, why would a Christian do a thing like that? 
That seems to be an artificial limitation. It's a truncated approach. Think about this. In about three hours or so, we'll be eating lunch somewhere in this area. Let's say you decide to go to one of the local Chinese restaurants. Methodological naturalism is like going to a Chinese buffet and then selecting your lunch with your eyes closed. I'm sure you could do that, and I'm sure you'd get something to eat, but why would you do a thing like that? Right? What if you ended up with a plate full of octopus? You'd be chewing for 30 minutes, right? So you want to go to a restaurant with both your eyes wide open. You wouldn't limit yourself like that. Why don't you say, well, I'm just going to close my eyes when I'm eating at a Chinese restaurant. You would want everything at your disposal to choose the right meal. One of the greatest modern philosophers, Alvin Plantinga, said, and I quote, as Christians, we should pursue science using all that we know, what we know about God as well as what we know about his creation, and what we know by faith as well as what we know in other ways, end quote. If we really want to understand God's creation, why would we limit the kinds of entities we can appeal to? If we need to invoke something supernatural in order to understand some part of God's creation, then we should do that. As I see it, the real problem with methodological naturalism is this. It wants to separate methodology from metaphysics. So let me explain. We believe in God and supernatural things, metaphysics. But when we're doing science, we want to bracket all of that out in our methodology. We keep what we really believe about the world separate from our scientific methodology. And I, my reaction is like, if only, right? That's not how it works. If you do science as if, meta, as if metaphysical naturalism is true, as if God is not there, then surprise, surprise, you're going to get results consistent with metaphysical naturalism. Um, and so here's a perceptive quote from a Canadian philosopher who kind of gets at this. Um, here's what he says. Insisting that methodological naturalism be adopted implicitly commits one either to the claim that supernatural agents do not exist, or to the claim that if they do, they never intervene on the natural order. This, however, begs the important question of whether such claims are justified, insofar as it guarantees that no matter what the evidence is, it cannot be thought to lead to a supernatural cause, methodological naturalism makes the claim that all physical events have natural causes unfalsifiable. So this is what it boils down to. Methodological naturalists do science as if God does not exist. They do science as if supernatural realities do not exist. And here's the problem as I see it. That kind of science produces a view of the world that is no different at all from naturalism a world in which God does not exist. All right, so Scout's Honor, right? Uh, I am actually not trying to be controversial on a Saturday morning. So, uh, but let me give you two examples uh, of what I'm talking about. First example, uh, you know what the traditional um, Christian position on human persons is? All right, suppose I ask you the question, what is the nature of human beings? What is their composition? Or to put it in more technical language, what is their metaphysical composition of you and me? How are we metaphysically composed? The tr Christian tradition has an answer to that question. Human beings are part physical and part non-physical creatures. We're material, part material and part immaterial. We are body and soul. Physically, I have a body and a brain, but I am not just limited to my body and brain. I have a soul. My body and soul are integrated holistically. You might call this position dualistic holism or 
holistic dualism. Um, when I die, I will be with the Lord in heaven, awaiting the final resurrection of the dead. As far as I can see, that's a clear teaching of Scripture, sometimes known as the doctrine of the intermediate state. When we die, we do not cease to exist. For those who belong to Christ, your body is dead. Yes, it goes to the ground, dust to dust. But your soul slash spirit goes to heaven in God's presence, awaiting the resurrection when you will be in the new heaven and new earth with the Lord. So we could look at many passages, but for the sake of time, I'll just mention one. In the book of Revelation, the apostle John is having a vision and he describes what he sees. In chapter 6, Jesus the, the Lamb is opening the seven seals. And we read this in verses 9 and 10. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long? Sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. I hope you caught that. These are believers who have been martyred. Their bodies are long decomposed, but guess what? They are still alive in an unnatural, disembodied state in heaven, and they await the resurrection. If someone you love has passed away and that person has trusted Christ for the forgiveness of sins, then I can say without a shadow of doubt that she is with Jesus right now. That's not a religious platitude. That is the sober truth. But now what happens if you try to figure out what the human person is using neuroscience? Not just neuroscience, but neuroscience using the lens of methodological naturalism. What happens? What would you conclude? Using that kind of neuroscience, a methodologically naturalistic neuroscience, you can only conclude that we are merely bodies and brains. That method forbids you from invoking a soul. Because a soul is immaterial, it is non-physical, it is supernatural. Methodological naturalism forbids you from using supernatural entities in your scientific explanations. Of course, you can believe we have souls when you're in church or when you're not doing science, but when you are practicing science, you dare not invoke a soul. In principle, then, this method, this method cannot understand the deepest dimension of who we are before God. And I think that's a problem. My second example is the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. This is the heart of biblical Christianity. The Son of God came in the flesh. He became incarnate. He was born of Mary in a manger. He became a human being just like us. And yet he lived righteously without sin. He did what Adam was unable to do. He did what Israel was unable to do. He did what we were unable to do. He died and then rose again after three days, making atonement for our sins. Now the question, how would methodological naturalism make sense of what happened at the first Easter? Remember the rules. You're not allowed to appeal to supernatural entities. Your explanation has to be natural, material, physical. Do you see the problem? If you want a proper answer to the question of what happened to Jesus in the tomb, you have to invoke miraculous divine action. God did something unusual. The resurrection was a miracle a supernatural event, something that utterly defies a natural explanation. Methodological naturalism, in principle, cannot understand that part of reality that happened around 30 AD. Sometimes things happen in God's world 
that are not merely natural or physical processes. Sometimes God shows up in special ways. And in such cases, we need bigger explanations. If we want to understand the world as it really is, methodological naturalism is not enough, not by a long shot. Well, if not methodological naturalism, then what? What, what I'm about to say may be controversial to some of you. Uh, no doubt Ian is going to set me straight in the Q&A or in the panel discussion. Uh, and if I say anything, right, from now on, if I say anything really, really messed up, blame Pastor Matt O'Reilly, right? Because this is his event, not mine. My hands are clean. All right, so methodological naturalism is ultimately unhelpful. As a method, it cannot fully describe the world we live in. God is real, and he's very much active in the world. His creation is teeming with supernatural entities, realities, angels, demons, and a devil who seeks to destroy your soul. That is the world of scripture. And my friends, the world of scripture is the only world there is. Many of my good friends are methodological naturalists, so I want to be fair to this position. And what they would say to me at this point in my talk is this, look, scientific descriptions are not meant to be exhaustive of reality. They are only limited descriptions. They are only natural, physical descriptions of the world. As scientists who are believers, we are not saying that natural, physical descriptions cover all that exists. Methodological naturalism and the science that it generates only claim to give a limited take on reality. It's not the full story. Right? So that's what they would say. And actually, I like that response. Um, and if that's what we mean by methodological naturalism, then that lessens my worry. It doesn't remove it, but it lessens it. But in practice, um, I don't think that's how science works for most people. Um, if you haven't noticed, science has a lot of power in our culture. For most people, science is the authority for what counts as knowledge. And it tries to speak into wider and wider areas of our lives. And related to that, there's the problem of scientism, which Ian highlighted too yesterday. Scientism, it's in the air that we breathe. It affects non-scientists and scientists alike. And I'm going to say more about scientism in my second talk. All that to say, I do recognize that there is a careful, modest, limited version of methodological naturalism. But still, even with that qualification, I still think Christians need to say more than methodological naturalism. So I say, are you ready? All of us should be supernaturalists. That means that we believe in the world of natural causes and effects, but we also believe in the world of supernatural causes and effects. That is the world of scripture, and it is the world that we live in right now. There is no other world. What that means is that the scientist should draw on everything he knows about reality as he investigates nature. That includes anything that he knows by divine revelation. A Christian supernaturalist doing science should have access to everything he knows about creation, the incarnation, resurrection, ascension, regeneration. Um, that would also include miraculous answers to prayer and the reality of souls, angels, demons, principalities, and powers. These beliefs will be part of the assumptions that a believing scientist brings to his or her work. Bear in mind that supernaturalism will often come to the same conclusions as naturalistic science. The difference is when science does investigate a portion of creation or a portion of history where supernatural realities are relevant. That's where it's different. For example, that might be the case for um, that might be the case with the origins of humanity. Um, in those instances, supernaturalist science 
will not explain those away. If the processes in creation are natural, then we should come up with natural explanations. Supernaturalism does not ignore natural explanations when those are called for. But if a supernatural explanation makes the best sense of the data, including the data from God's word, then that's the better conclusion. All right, as I start uh, wrapping things up, I want to mention two practical benefits of supernaturalism as opposed to methodological naturalism. The first point is this. There is a profound irony. One of the issues that we as Christians complain about is that science and faith are always being portrayed as opposed to each other. Many of you grew up believing that science and faith are on opposite sides of the spectrum, right? Enemies in mortal combat, Sherlock versus Moriarty, science versus theology, the secular forces lined up on one side, the angels of light on the other. This is a civil war, a battle to the death. May the best man win. We all grew up with those images, with those cliches. Think about the new atheists like Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens. These guys have been writing books criticizing Christianity as a plague on humanity. And Ian's talk yesterday covered all of that in a really helpful way. And that's why many Christians complain about this notion that science and faith are in conflict. It's way too simplistic. We rightly warn against this warfare picture, and we emphasize how science and faith are actually much, much closer than the media or than popular culture leads us to believe. Generally speaking, that's all great. That's wonderful stuff. Science and faith, they're not enemies. Science at its best is men and women investigating the beauty and wonder of God's creation. But here's the thing. Scripture tells us that sometimes, perhaps often, supernatural entities and powers and events take place in our space-time reality. That's one thing. But what does methodological naturalism say? Scientists must not appeal to any supernatural entities at all. It seems to me that if Christians accept methodological naturalism, then conflict between science and faith becomes virtually inevitable. That's, that might be the most controversial thing I said in this talk. Supernaturalists avoid this problem. Supernaturalism reduces conflicts between science and faith. I think that's counterintuitive, but I'll commend that thought. Now, some of you uh, may be worried that I am pitting the natural against the supernatural, which is a problem. That leads to a kind of semi-deistic way of thinking. And many lay people think that way, and it's not helpful. Um, and I agree. And in my second talk, you'll see that I'm actually not pitting the two against each other at all. My understanding of supernatural includes everything that we mean when we say natural. Supernaturalism includes natural, but it includes much more than that. And I'll, I'll, I'll develop that in the second talk as well. My second point is this. As I said at the start of my talk, these issues are not ivory tower um, theological speculation. Uh, this is not just abstract. We're all caught up in these questions. Do we live in the world of scripture or are we wandering around in the matrix, believing all the naturalistic myths of our culture? You may never have experienced a miracle. You may not know any people who have, but that doesn't mean they're not real, does it, right? You've never seen God. Does that mean God does not exist? You probably have never seen anyone resurrected from the dead. Does that mean the resurrection of the dead is a myth? Of course not. Here's what I would suggest. If you are a Christian, I hope you pray regularly. We are most human when we are praying. The mark of a true theologian is one who lives a life of prayer. When you pray, I encourage you to name angels and demons. Talk to God about heaven and hell. 
These are realities that are not accessible to us empirically, but praying about them keeps us tethered to biblical reality in our devotional lives. Here's an example of a short prayer. Lord, protect us from the powers of darkness. Protect us from the devil and surround us with your holy angels. I pray that way regularly, and I would recommend that to you. Those forces are real, and praying that way reminds us of their reality. I would also suggest reading missionary biographies. Get to know missionaries and hear their stories. And I hope this church supports missionaries as well. I'm sure it does. Hang out with Christians from other cultural contexts. They don't have the same cultural blind spots that we have here in North America. They can help you distance yourself from the naturalism that permeates our lives and thereby draw you closer to the world of holy writ. Naturalism is not enough. Methodological naturalism is not enough. If scientists want to understand the world we live in, they must be sensitive to the world as it really is, a world of angels and demons, a world of the natural and the supernatural, a world, yes, of ordinary providence, but one that is no stranger to divine miracles. Indeed, a world charged with the grandeur of God. God is my witness. I am not asking for regular science to be less than what it is at its best. I'm just wondering if it can be more. Thank you. We've got time for questions and answers. Um, we've got our, our folks who are going to carry microphones around, so if you want to raise a question, jump in. Stunned silence. <laughs> I'll, I will, I'll, your, your talk raised a number of interesting points for me, and perhaps we can have some discussion and if questions come along feel free to chime in raise hands but it sounds like you are reacting against in the sciences what um, some of us pastors are reacting against in theology mm -hmm. um, because so much of published theology in the last 200 years has sidelined super the supernatural mm -hmm. and that's resulted in it's not simply an academic discussion. Uh, it's resulted in, in our United Methodist world, we're feeling the effects of that with an impending separation mm -hmm. because you've got um, certain theological methods on one side and mm -hmm. others on the other side. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm sure there are some points of connection, and I wonder if you could comment a bit on, on yeah. how those relate. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's a perceptive observation. Um, uh, just for any theology geeks in the house. Uh, there is actually an essay that makes that exact point. Um, Alvin Plantinga has an essay, um, and um, the title is going to come to me. But he, he actually says that, that that methodological naturalism is a, is a problem in biblical study, has been a problem in biblical studies, just as it has been in science. And, so it, and it's, a, it's a similar dynamic. Um, um, and you know, if we want to understand the world we live in, and if we want to understand the biblical text, that we, we can't sort of bracket, like trying to bracket out certain beliefs to try and understand scripture or to try and understand the world we live in, it, it seems counterproductive to what scripture is and to the world, the kind of world we live in. So I, I, I do think, and there's a theological interpretation of scripture uh, is a kind of a movement in academia, which I know you, you're well familiar with, which is trying to push back against that in, in biblical studies. Um, and uh, so the comments I'm making now, um, it's, I, I think I, I'm trying to propose something similar, but I think I do, I do acknowledge there is a challenge, right? And probably, and maybe this will come up in the panel discussion, but I mean, the biggest challenge with what I'm saying 
is that um, science is, the way science has developed, I mean, it's happening in research universities, it's happening in a you know, sort of secular, post-Christian kind of climate with, public, with journals and uh, publications, et cetera. The idea of, of being a supernaturalist as opposed to a methodological naturalist, e even, if, even if sort of, if we had a bunch of uh, scientists in the house who sort of say, you know what, I agree with you, but the practicality of that in our cultural context, I admit that that's a, that's a problem. But to my mind, that's a separate problem. That's a separate question. Like, is this practical? You know, I, I, I'm a bit pessimistic on that unless the Lord does something mighty. But, but the more interesting question for me is, like, what's the right way to think about this? That's helpful. And um, as we get ready for questions, let me encourage all of us to get to our questions as quickly as possible, and that will give our, our guests time uh, to respond to that. There's one here, and while the microphone's coming right there, third row flip, I'll say Hans and I are both involved or have a relationship to an organization called the Center for Pastor Theologians, which is pastors attempting to do significant theological work, but pushing back against some of those, some of those academic assumptions on how theology act grateful for that work that he's involved in too. I was trained as a medical technologist in laboratory science yep. and quantitative and qualitative analysis was my life. Right. Um, but I'm, a, I'm, I'm a also a, a Christian educator and a, uh, I, I work with women in crisis and I see the spiritual realm and the physical realm as mirror images of one another mm -hmm. and, and I, I apply the process analysis to the problem solving of life mm -hmm. and and I see the spiritual realm um, at work all the time in the in the real life laboratory of dealing with crisis in our lives mm -hmm. and God's always present and there's nothing more exciting than the moment when somebody's eyes are opened to that reality mm -hmm. And when Jesus was telling parables and saying, let those with eyes see, eyes to see, see, and those with ears to he hear, hear, I think he was talking about the presence of that spiritual reality in, in, in that mirror image of our physical reality. Do you experience life that way? Yeah, I mean, thanks for that comment, uh, and I applaud you. Um, you know, I mean, as, as Matt was mentioning, um, you know, I was in the medical world uh, briefly, and um, I do think I, I do think a lot of people maybe would share your perspective, but my sense is sort of the medicine and hospitals and so on in general uh, make it, and perhaps more so in Europe as well, make it much harder to do that to 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 live the way you're describing a, a very sort of into to be able to uh, treat and counsel patients in a very integrated way as a Christian. I think a lot of people find that hard, and so I applaud you, uh, and I, I think that's a really admirable uh, way that you approach your calling, and, uh, and I think what you said, the way you put it resonates with what, I've, what I was trying to share, so I appreciate that. I'd, I would be interested to hear, you mentioned the holistic dualism, some soul body issues, mm -hmm. and uh, in my own research I've run into a lot of those dynamics on what does it mean to be human, resurrection, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. There is a move, uh, in a significant move, I think, among practicing theologians now, away from an affirmation of a soul uh, to that you know that the physical body is all we are, and mm -hmm. that's what will be raised, and there's mm -hmm. not much in between mm -hmm. to oversimplify. But I'd, I'd be interested to hear, since you touched on that, maybe right. a little bit more uh, in way of, by way of response to right. folks who take the the monistic view there. Right, right. So Matt, Matt's point is mentioning. So if you if you actually went to a library to, to see what are, what are Bible scholars saying about who we are? Um, what are they saying about the resurrection? What you would see in recent years, a number of them are saying something like this. Um, you know, like, and, and, and I, yeah, I'm summarizing a lot of complicated stuff, right? So bear that in mind. But they would say something like this. You know, your grandparents may have believed that we have souls, right? Um, these immaterial things, and, um, and when you die, your soul goes to be with Jesus. Um, your great-grandparents may have thought that, but what, like today, we know that's not the case. 
Right? We know that from neuroscience, we know that functional MRIs, MRI studies, uh, you know, psychiatry, and so on. It really, like, the stuff that Thomas Aquinas thought the soul did, and, and when you go back to, you know, a medieval theologian and you sort of see what, how he describes the soul, and then you look at what we know the brain does, the, 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 the feeling is that he was just talking about the brain, but the early Christians didn't understand what the brain did, so they had to talk about this thing called the soul. But we now know it's just bodies and brains all the way down. Right? So, in the, so then um, the emphasis is on, and at, at the same time, I think Christians in the past have tended to have a, like, a really ambiguous view of the physical body. And, and actually, I, I think rightly we would say kind of a problematic view of the physical body when, in fact, Scripture says God the Son became incarnate. Like he took on human flesh. That's a big deal with, with, with Christmas. And then Easter, he was raised bodily. And like from, from, from Easter until eternity, God the Son will be the God-man. Will be will will have this resurrected body. So the body is a big deal. So like I think those two insights have led a lot of theologians to say, you know what? When you when we die, we die. But then we, when Jesus comes back, we will be miraculously bodily resurrected. This whole business of a soul and the intermediate state, we don't need to believe that anymore. Um, and and a lot of people will sort of make arguments from scripture and such. And I. I, okay, there's my two points, I'll say. What I like about that is I really appreciate the emphasis on the physical body and that the body is good, material creation is good, and if Christians have demeaned the body uh, in the past, we should no longer do that. And so I applaud that. I appreciate that. But the, my second point is a critical point. I, my sense is that actually, and, and this is a little controversial, but I mean, I think just from what I can see, I think what's really motivating this shift is that these scholars, kind of their, their, their neuroscientists, friends, colleagues, the literature is saying that there, is, that there is no soul, there is no immaterial. So it's kind of like, well, that's the case, you know, and that's God's general revelation, and so we know there are no souls. Well, now let's come back to the Bible and try to make sense of what does it look like if we have no souls. And, then, and so then you see this movement where you have an emphasis on the body, bodily resurrection. We're not immortal souls, right? That's, we're not immortal souls. We're, you know, that Christ doesn't promise the immortality of the soul. He promises bodily resurrection. Uh, I think the science is driving that. And I think um, and it's a longer conversation, but I think I, I don't think it's the case that any of that science disproves the soul. And in fact, I think the best people writing in this will admit that the science doesn't prove that we're body and soul or that we're only bodies. The science doesn't prove that at all. Um, but, but then they will go on to say, here's why I think we're only bodies. And I think at least I disagree with that, but I think that's a more careful way of putting it. It's helpful. I, I wonder if we could sum it saying there's kind of two issues. Number one, um, to say there is no soul based on the findings of neuroscience is a methodological problem because neuroscience isn't equipped to make metaphysical right, claims. Right, right. And it violates the principle Ian articulated last night of complementary explanations. Uh, just because science has an explanation for emotions doesn't mean there's not right. another, another approach to that too. So other right. questions, That's other good. questions. Hey, thanks for your talk today. I really appreciate it. Uh, so kind of a more practical question, yep. if you don't mind. So let's say I, I hold this supernatural wor worldview, yep. and I'm teaching a bunch of young people who are going to go into an educational system yep. that's predominantly naturalism. Yeah. Um, how do I... So I believe it. Yep. I teach them, but yep. I'm going to say, well, <laughs> the, rea the actuality that you know, you're going to see a, a demon being exercised or anything yep. supernatural is pretty low, yep. and... Your, your faith is going to be torn apart over the next four years. How would, how would you help our young people? What would you do? What would you say? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, to be honest, I think that question, that um, in some ways, the fact that we live in a post-Christian 
sort of increasingly post-Christian era, I think we're all sort of facing that. Uh, it wouldn't just be people planning to go into the sciences. And so, so I think, I mean, one step would be just sort of imagining, being able to imagine what, what does it mean to be a Christian in this world? And is there any place we can go to, for instance, in church history or in the Bible that can help us? Like in the Bible, for instance, you might think that, you know, perhaps spent doing Bible studies and sort of meditating on passages like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how, what it was like to be in Babylon um, and to be these faithful Israelites in a culture, learning the literature and the, the books and so on that were completely opposed to the worship of Yahweh, that perhaps can we get, can we get sort of ideas, either uh, substantive or just even imaginative ideas about what it means to live in the 21st century now in our cultural context? And then also um, in church history, looking at, like, at the uh, second, you know, second and third century Christians, believers, and some of the struggles they faced before Constantine sort of, you know, made it uh, a Roman religion or whatever. Before then, you know, Christians were beleaguered, minor they were a minority, surrounded by paganisms of all kinds, and yet were faithful. So again, I think, I think even like um, not looking to the, Ref the Reformation perhaps isn't as helpful to kind of, for us to imagine what it's like to be faithful today and, and going to some of these earlier periods in church history and, and drawing lessons from that. So that, that's kind of a, a general point. And then on, on what we're talking about more specifically, I mean, one, bear in mind what I said. Like, um, even on my view, the supernaturalism that I'm trying to commend, it has everything that the naturalist, the methodological naturalism has and more, right? So, uh, so it means, so someone going into uh, physics lab or whatever, wanting to be a, phys uh, a physicist or a chemist, they, it's not like, wait, I'm going to be doing this. This is all going to be different from what I'm being taught. That, that, that's not the case. For, as I said, supernaturalism will, ha will, will look the same in many cases. But I think where it does get tricky or interesting is if you're a biologist and then you're looking at the question like, where do human beings come from? Uh, then, it, then it becomes interesting. Then you, you, you know what the mainstream account says and, and how that plays. And, but then as a Christian, you, you have there's other things that you know that bear on that question. Um, and, and honestly, at that point, that, that's just a difficult, that's a, that's a difficult issue. There's lots, there's, I mean, there's disagreement on that. Um, of what's the best strategy? And, um, and that, you know, that, that's just something that, that inv would involve prayer and lots of conversation and, and thinking tactfully and strategically and so on. I'm not, I'm not sure that I can drop um, a one minute Solomonic wisdom on that one, but we, we could talk more about that, but yeah. Uh. I, I wonder, let me come to you, Willie, and while, while the mic's coming, I'll ask one question. How would that, the, I guess that, to, to push that point a little further, yep. the chemist or in a lab or an astronomer with a telescope, uh, what what does um, what 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 do conclusions look like? Because say you've got you know an astronomer doing the work. There's a certain amount of time has passed to guess where we are. Uh, there's certain elements that are present that has created the specific conditions. You know there there's some folks who might say, well that you know points to design like our conversation. Mm -hmm. What do the conclusions look like? And are they really conclusions? Right? Is that not susceptible to the thing I just said about neuroscience and the soul, that you're drawing metaphysical conclusions from. I, how, I'm, I'm curious, maybe, yeah. to push Dan's question a little further. Yeah. What is that, how does that play out, nine um, to five in the lab? Yeah, one, one, um, one thought I have on that is, um, ha has to do um, with this idea of the um, noetic effects of sin, uh, which is the idea that um, Sin, uh, actually this came up in the Q&A yesterday, but, but sin has affected our minds. It, it's affected the way we think and the way we reason. Um, and um, that raises a question when we're looking at different disciplines, you can ask the question, what are, 
do, are the, do the noetic effects of sin show up as significantly in all disciplines, or are there some disciplines where it's, it's much greater, and so if you're a Christian, you've got to be much more attentive than with other disciplines. Um, so, you know, uh, theologians like Abraham Kuyper and Emma Bruner and others have thought about this. There's actually a good book um, on this, on uh, the noetic effects of sin, but let me boil down the issue. So when you're dealing with, like, physics, and uh, like the idea is if the discipline concerns uh, topics or questions that are close to what it means to be human, uh, close to what, what the human person is, then the, uh, the effects of sin on that discipline, that tension is higher. The further away you are from such questions, the less, the less, um, the less urgent or the less significant the, the effects of sin. So what, that means that um, psychology, sociology, the, you know, some of the humanities that are closer to what it means to be human, you're going to see more conflict. And if you're a Christian and you want to you want to become you want to be a professor in sociology or in psychology, you're going to have to wrestle with these questions and methodologically and and so on presuppositions, assumptions, um, and, and 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 all the rest. Those are going to be very live questions. Now, if you're going to physics or chemistry, I'm not saying that there are no noetic effects of sin. There are they are there, but I think um, those disciplines, the hard sciences. Uh, theology does matter, but I think the noetic effects of sin are less. The effects of sin on the on reasoning and so on are in some ways less than they are with sociology and psychology. So um, that that's uh, in some ways that's maybe a general point, but that's why I would say that probably if uh, I, I met a high school student or college student who wanted to be a psychologist or who wanted to be a sociologist, and they wanted to meet with me to talk about that. And then there was another student who wanted to go into physics or wanted to go into chemistry. I suspect I, would spend, I, may, I may spend three hours talking to the student who wanted to go into psychology or sociology and less time talking to the one who wanted to go into physics or chemistry. But that's not to let physics and chemistry off the hook, but it's just to point out that, that there is, I think there is a difference between different dif disciplines. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, supernaturalists uh, do not ignore natural explanations but allow for right. supernatural causes when the natural ends don't, don't come together. Uh, in your work, do you find many instances where the natural explanations cannot be attributed? And if you, and if you could, uh, describe some of those yeah. instances. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was tempted to, to to do the Ian move and say, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a scientist, man. I'm a theologian. <laughs> That's not the kind of work I do. Um, but um, um, no, let's see. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, one one. This is maybe this is maybe from the reverse direction, but it was it's why I gave the example of neuroscience. So I think. <clears throat> So I think uh, neuroscientists can do all kinds of interesting work, and can you know like if you if you um, if you um, stimulate the amygdala or if you stimulate the hippocampus or this part of the brain, you know the the subject has religious experiences. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, and you know someone if someone has has a certain seizure disorder, that can affect them religiously. Or if someone is, um, you know, a psychiatrist, you know, there's lo lots of interesting kinds of uh, observations about people with psychotic, going through a psychotic episode as schizophrenic, who have this thing called hyper-religiosity. And everything they say sort of has to do with God, but they're going through this, they're going through this phase, of this, ma this psychotic phase. So, so you've got all of that data. So now someone could say, therefore, Right. Therefore, religious, you know, all all the stuff surrounding religion, it all goes back to the brain, and thus we don't have to believe in souls. And what and so so this is kind of maybe from a diff, different direction to your question. But I'm not, no, that doesn't follow. 
right? It doesn't follow that, um, you know, one of the famous cases uh, that people uh, historically have pointed to is this guy called Phineas Gage, and he was, uh, he, he, you know, he was doing this work, uh, um, and uh, in his work, so a, a pole, it was, a, it was this tragic accident, and a pole kind of, like, basically went through his brain, uh, through his head, and he survived, but like his personality changed, he became really difficult to work with, and, and he was eventually fired, et cetera. His whole character changed. And so there's a, there's a kind of argument that, that is like, well, look, you know, there you go, Phineas Gates, the, the pole went through his head, that proves there is no soul because, you know, it's obviously the brain, and, and uh, as Matt was saying, well, like, you can't, you can't derive metaphysical conclusions like that from uh, uh, that kind of event. And it's not as if Augustine and Luther and Calvin and Wesley, for instance, didn't know, like, hey, if you bash someone's brain, weird things are going to happen. Like, I mean, they knew all that, but that, that doesn't disprove that, oh, therefore we don't have souls. So, so in, that, in that regard, I guess I would say just because these sciences are producing data or deriving these uh, uh, you know, uh, experiments and so on that have a bearing on kind of our, 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 how we express ourselves religiously, emotionally, and so on, we can accept all that. But it's you're making a you're adding a philosophical claim when you then say therefore this proves there is no soul. Um, your question was your, the specific way you asked your question was more kind of ha, uh, can you give can I give instances when scientists have discovered things in the lab and those discoveries can only be explained supernaturally and not naturally. Now that gets into fairly controversial terrain, so I'm not going to say too much about this. I'm just going to kind of maybe, maybe it's me throwing a softball for Ian to whack out of the park later on. But the, he did refer to the intelligent design movement, and there, that, that's the one thing that comes to mind. There, there are a number of scientists who are who are claim, who point to this thing that they call irreducible complexity, and they would say that looking at the uh, bacterial flagellum. For instance, that was the famous one that a Catholic called Michael Behe came up with. But they have many, many examples where it's like, especially with uh, tech, the techno technology, as it's getting better and better, we're able to see the cell and, very, and aspects of the cell in incredible detail. And their argument is, look at this structure and look at the complexity of this structure we can't imagine any natural way that structure could ever have arisen. It's impossible because you take away you take away just this little part, then then uh, the whole thing falls apart. How could you get this? So that's what they mean by irreducible complexity. And then they would say that points to a designer, which is more than a natural explanation. And a natural explanation cannot cannot make sense of this thing. Um, the pushback from not just from non-Christians but from fellow Christians who are scientists is that, hey, we can come up with a counterexample. We can explain that naturalistically. And then, so if you Google irreducible complexity and you got lots of hours in the day, then you could sort of see the back and forth. But that would be an example maybe along the lines that you're asking for. Can you expand on the influence of demons and angels in the world? <laughs> this is a Methodist church, man. I don't want it to get wild in here. <laughs> no. Um, um, well, well, I'll say this, uh, which I, which, I, and actually, I'll, well, one thing I'll say is I'm going to touch on that in my second talk. So, um, and maybe as a preview. I will, say, I will say that I think for us here, we do have a tendency to associate the reality of angels and demons with kind of like spiritual, sort of, it gets spiritually wild and interesting and crazy. That, that's, we, so we make that association. We're like, hey, why are the Africans having all the fun? Why, you know, why are the South Koreans having all the fun? What about us in, in this domain?
Um, but uh, my pushback to that uh, is that, hey, actually, um, I think the kinds of ways that we find ourselves to be very secular or to be affected by the secular age that we're in and the ways in which it's really easy for us to live as if God doesn't exist um, and all the ways, all the different permutations of that for us in this culture, uh, you think the devil has nothing to do with that? You, you, know, what I, you know what I mean? Uh, and so, so I do think... I do think like the, the, he's the prince of this age, right? Like he's like a roaring lion, and so the the, the fact that our young people are having so uh, are struggling. I mean, we could talk about gender dysphoria, and uh, the, you know, people are don't believe that like in the binary male and female that you know there's a whole spectrum. Like all of these challenges, where some of you are like, man, I woke up one day and I was like, what happened to the world we we're in? Like what do you what what do you think? Do you think this is? Do you think that there aren't there isn't a spiritual element to this? So that that would be my that maybe that would be the, the comment I'd make now that I think even when it's not glitzy and glamorous in the, like it's not a deliverance thing going on and like it 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 seems like like really secular. That I'd suggest maybe those are some of the ways that the devil and the powers of darkness are most at work. Yeah, I'm almost inclined to say, does, does it almost seem more nefarious in that yeah, way? Yeah, in some ways, yeah. Because it's under the radar. Because it's, yeah, that's right. So. I just had um, one comment. Um, last evening, Dr. Hutchinson um, kind of brought up the idea, well, not brought up. He, he um, gave us scripture from Romans 1, um, where Paul was talking about a man's impression of the world. And I think that's a place where we as Christians have to come from. Um, I think going on in that same chapter of Romans 1, in verse 21, it says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Mm -hmm. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made, made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals. Therefore, God gave them over. He goes on to say, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so, they, so God gave them over to a depraved mind mm -hmm. so that they would do what they, uh, what they ought not to be done. Although they knew God's righteous decree, they only continued to do these very things but approve of those who practice them. And I think, um, you know, in this setting, what are your thoughts about... <laughs> You know, it seems like Paul was wrestling with the same issues that we were, and though we may call it postmodern, post-Christian, mm -hmm. it seems like the world just keeps spinning on those same principles. And when we as Christians recognize God as the beginning and worship him rather than the creation, mm -hmm. and then our beliefs get disordered, our actions get disordered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, amen. Uh, you know, no, I... I, I I, I like that. I, um, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I do think there's a sense in which um, there's nothing new under the sun, spiritually speaking, you know what I mean? Uh, and the ways in which uh, men and women uh, find um, idols, worship idols instead of the living God, uh, that, that's an old, that's, that's an old problem, as old as uh, uh, humanity. Uh, so, so in that sense, um, uh, one interesting sort of offshoot uh, prompted by you know your observations one interesting question is is you know um, some of the wider some of the wider challenges that um, particularly in the area of sexuality that, that, that Christians are facing in our culture that you know it does raise the question is is this this does feel like it's another level of sort of difficulty. Um, it's not clear that, in a, it, when you look at earlier ages, it, it sort of seems, it, it would seem as if, yeah, the, the underlying spiritual struggles are the same, but there's this, there's this a feeling that the, the, what's at stake for us today has been um, amped up some. And so that's, that, that, that might be an interesting question. Is it, is it just it's no, it's just the same. It's the same old song. Um, Christians have always struggled with it. Or is there kind of a, a new level of challenge that we face spiritually today? That, I mean, that could be an interesting conversation. But overall, yeah, I, I resonate with what you said. <laughs>
along the lines on just reflecting on worship, sin, something in the sciences. It, it's a have the sciences shed light for us on sort of how um, you know you might say that Romans describes some habitual practices or at least uh, consistent giving of oneself to, to mm-hmm. things other than God. Mm-hmm. Um, we know more about how habits form and how they affect, and, mm-hmm. and does that shed light on what it means to be a slave to sin? Mm-hmm. Theologically, I wonder, uh, you might comment on that a bit. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's right. Um, um, you know, something I haven't, I didn't emphasize as much, and maybe it was more implicit or explicit in Ian's talk yesterday, was there are ways, um, so here are two categories, concepts. So this special revelation and this general revelation. And um, general revelation and science are not one and the same thing, but the scientist is is explore, is investigating God's creation. And um, and so in some ways, the scientist is, exp- is investigating God's general revelation. But they're not one and the same, because the, what the scientist is doing is imperfect, whereas general revelation, God's re- revelation of himself in creation, there's nothing imperfect about it. But you've got special revelation scripture, for let's say, and then you've got general revelation. And the emphasis of my talk has been on how, like, hey, let's not forget special revelation and the bearing that it has on what the scientist is doing. Um, but at the same time, um, we need to understand special revelation, and we need to figure out what God is saying and what that means. And the scientist is trying to figure out God's general revelation, at just if we can put it that way, sometimes we don't really understand, we misunderstand special revelation or we just don't see the full influence. And sometimes the scientist, as he or she is exploring God's general revelation, can actually help us understand who we are in light of God's word better. And so an example of that would be, uh, this is like social psychology and uh, sorry, it's not going to be on the tip of my tongue because it's been a while since I read this literature. But there's some really interesting literature in social psychology on self-deception and ways in which, what, like our tendency to um, to give each other, uh, give myself a pass on things, but yet to judge others more severely. Um, my tendency to kind of where basically all the myriad of ways that we have blind spots for for ourselves or our side, and we judge people, the other person, more severely. Um, this is this is related to the doctrine of sin. This is related to the ways in which the human heart is. It, the, when Scripture speaks about you know whether you're Wesleyan or Calvinist, the, the ways in which sin affects us. Now, a, 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 a Bible-believing Christian could say, oh, yeah, I believe that we're sinners, right? Amen to that. But then you don't realize that in practice, there are all kinds of ways that's showing up, and you don't realize that. It's kind of hypocrisy, it's self-deception, and so on. The social psychology literature, which has nothing to do with theology explicitly, and is by, like, non-Christians, you read some of those studies, and it suddenly sheds amazing new light on what it means to be a sinner. And you, and you suddenly realize, oh my goodness, now I've read this thing by a secular scientist, and this person has really helped me see I need Jesus. You know, So I think that might be an yeah. example. And that we could say there are certain physical dynamics, physical symptoms to our spiritual problems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, we've come to time for a break. If you didn't get, if you have a question and didn't get to ask it, hold on to it, jot it down. We we'll have more time for Q and A as the day goes along. Uh, there's some snacks and goodies on this side of the room. Resources are in the back. Uh, we'll take about 20 minutes, then we'll come back together for Hans's second talk. So break time.